Mary for the reading of scripture on today. The title of the sermon is Write the Vision. The subtitle is Shifts, S-H-I-F-T-S, Happens. Shifts happen. Great shifts happen. Great shifts happen in life. They happen in business. Great shifts happen in institutions. Great shifts happen throughout God's story. Great shifts happen in the church. Sometimes we aren't aware when something we're a part of is shifting because shifts may span several generations. A shift may begin in our lifetime, but the shift is not final in our lifetime. So in any particular generation, it's difficult to fully sense or appreciate the shift, but that does not change the reality that great shifts happen. If we really think about it, we are familiar with major shifts in life. Shifts from horses and buggies to planes, trains, and automobiles. Shifts from outhouses to indoor restrooms. Got a funny story to tell you about that later if you, if you want to hear it. Shifts from phones with that long spiral cord and rotary dial. Somebody saying, hey, I still have that phone. I still have that phone. All right. And that operator, some young folks don't even know what we're talking about, but that operator you can call by dialing zero and ask for the phone number of pretty much anybody or anything. And if their phone was listed in that big, thick, yellow phone book that you probably had somewhere, I used to sit on it at my auntie's beauty shop, <laughs> to cell phones which are really small but very powerful computers, which mine is missing at the moment. If I see a phone, let me know. In the palm of our hands, and instead of dialing zero, we say, hey, Google, or hey, Siri. And Siri says, huh? A computerized voice quickly searches for what we need, and a shift that I can't even explain yet. Maybe we have an expert in the room on AI that is already being used in just about every arena of our society, impacting our lives in ways in which we are unaware. Great shifts happen. Shifts have happened in our faith, believers of God, and we're in the midst of a great shift today. We've actually experienced a shift. We're, we're part of orchestrating a shift when we decided to go remote during the pandemic. We have hybrid worship. I think God was illustrating by causing, my phone is missing at the moment. But we have congregants who are in full participation and contributions of our church our online congregation, our Zoom congregation, some of who have never entered this building and may never enter this building, but they are still a full part of Hyde Park Union Church. Can we give God praise for our online Zoom congregation? Something prior generations would have never imagined, but great Shifts happen. And there are more shifts to happen, and we struggle with, with shifts when we feel them, unless they are thrust upon us and we have no choice. Future generations will never know that we struggle with shifts, for it will happen and be settled and be what God wants it to be based on God's plans for the church. Shifts happen, and there's a shift happening in today's scripture. For one, the rulership of Israel has shifted from King Saul to King David. King David has been victorious at war in the book of 2 Samuel, including against the Philistines, and the Ark of the Covenant has been recovered. 
The Ark of the Covenant is central to the story. The Ark of the Covenant was a storage chest decorated in gold that contained, among other things, the tablets of the Ten Commandments. It was created according to the pattern that God gave to Moses when the Israelites were encamped at the foot of Mount Sinai. Its presence was representative of the presence of God such that we, wherever the Ark of the Covenant was, for them, so was God. The Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the Philistines and recovered by David in battle, and now the battle is over and King David has been victorious. That's where our scripture picks up 2 Samuel 7 verse 1 reads, now when the king was settled in his house, verse 2, the king said to the prophet Nathan, see now I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, and Nathan's the prophet, go do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. And now David has the Ark of the Covenant, a.k.a. the Ark of God. It, it has existed now for approximately 400 years, if my math is correct, and represents great tradition, very important history, and the literal presence of God with the people of Israel. The Ark of God has been with him and the people in the midst of war, and, and for now the war is over, and David is settling in as king in a cedar house that was built for him, and, and now he wants to build a house, a palace, some translations say, for the Ark of God. The prophet Nathan, who King David seems to consult about this, affirms David, giving him the go-ahead to build a house for the Ark of God. Good intentions, seems to make sense, aligns with tradition. You're the king, God is with you. The prophet Nathan says, go for it. Listen to the shift in verse 4. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, go and tell my servant David. Thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word that any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? God speaks and calls for a shift. And the first shift God calls for is in the advice Nathan gave to David. While Nathan previously told David, sure, build the house, do what you want to do, you're anointed, God makes Nathan shift. He basically tells Nathan, go and take that back. Then God educates Nathan so he can educate David on a shift God made a long time ago. God says, go tell my servant, catch that word servant, he may be king, but to God he's servant, go tell him I haven't lived in a house since I liberated the people of Israel from bondage in Egypt. In other words, when I set them free, I set myself free, and I haven't been in a house since. God says, I've been moving among the people. And let me insert a point there. When making good decisions about God's house and about the ministries of the church, you've got to make sure it aligns with God. And to know if it aligns with God, you've got to know God. You've got to know how God is moving in the world and what God desires and where God is present. King David desired to build a house for God, but Proverbs 19 and 2 states, Desire without knowledge is not good, and one who moves too hurriedly misses the way. So God told Nathan to offer David this knowledge. I made a shift when I shifted my people out of bondage. I haven't been in a house since because there's no way I could go with my people when they left Egypt if I stayed in the house. 
my preference is to live among the people. Then God literally said in verse 7, did you ever hear me ask for a house? A good way to know God is to hear from God. Seek God's face. Listen for the voice of God, and if you're a person that believes in God, then that's not just for our decisions here, it's for your life. It's wise to seek not only godly counsel, but to seek God. Hearing from God is paramount, but as David demonstrated, it's often skipped when making decisions about God and God's work and God's people. So God tells Nathan to go and help David make a shift in his understanding of God's preferences. God does not prefer to dwell in a house. God prefers to dwell among the people. And God never asked David to build a house for the ark in the first place. God has more for the prophet Nathan to say to David in verse 8. He says, now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be a prince over my people. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. Here, God wants Nathan to shift David's understanding of his own prominence and God's role in that prominence to aid the shift in David's understanding of God. Because as a servant, our knowledge of God impacts all that we do in God's name. I'm going to say that again. Because as servants of God, our knowledge, our understanding of God impacts all that we do in God's name. That's why we see so many versions of faith and believers in God because people have different understandings and those understandings drive what we do for God. So God told Nathan, go tell my servant David to look back over your life and see God's presence and provision. God says, tell David, I took you from following sheep, being a little shepherd boy, to leading my people. I did that. I've been with you wherever you went. That's the essence of who I am. I dwell with people. And more often than not, we need to look back over our lives, just see how far God has brought us from. There's a song from my childhood church that used to sing, Lord, you've been merciful to me. Looking back, Lord, You've been merciful to me. You brought me from a mighty long way. You let me see another day. Lord, you've been mighty, mighty good to me. God tells Nathan, tell David to look back over his life and to realize that that was me moving when I took him from the fields of sheep to conquer Goliath. That was me moving on you and moving through you. Every victory you've won, every challenge you've overcome, every place of prominence you've reached, you've reached it because I took you there. I placed you there. I opened that door. I made a way out of no way. And I'm reminding you, David, because it seems to me you need reminding because you want to place me in a nice house. And I work best outside the house. And I, and I did, throughout, as I did throughout your life, bringing you from shepherd boy to king. But most of all, you are my servant. Servants need a, a deeper understanding of the one they serve, if our understanding of God does not include acknowledging God's active presence in our lives, it impacts how we serve God. If we don't believe God met a need, 
Will we believe our service should meet people's needs? Whatever it is we believe about God, our desires and our actions in ministry follow suit. So if you haven't spent time pondering God's presence in your life, I have an assignment for you today. I promise it will bless you. I encourage you, some preachers say, to take inventory, right? I encourage you to look back over your life and do so prayerfully. Lord, show me your hand in my life and in my ancestors' lives. Consider the hand of God moving in your life and ask God to reveal that to you. God, where and when did you move on my or my family's behalf? God, what are the points in my story where I shall say, if it had not been for the Lord, who was on our side, on my side, on my parents, on my grandparents' side, allow the Spirit to speak to you and reveal to you God's presence in your story to bring you to where you are today. How'd I get here, God? I mean, I know how I got here, but how did I really get here? What, what things did you protect me from? When, when did you make sure my name was spoken in places where I wasn't? How did you order my steps and I thought it was me? Who did you use in my story, God? See, clearly we believe in God moving through stories just as we reference scripture. What about your own story? Powerful exercise. I pray that God uses this exercise to shift your understanding of who God is if it needs shifting and what God desires from you, God wants David to have a shift in his mindset about who God is, so he reminds him of all the things he's done for him and through him. And when David understands and we understand all the, the things that God has done for us and through us, we'll have a better understanding of the nature of God, the essence of God, the location of God, and the priorities of God. And, and it is not in a house at least not a house built by man's hands. And that's a great segue to the last lesson or the, the next lesson, last lesson of the text and the next shift that's happening. For there's something about a look back right before a look forward. It's used often in scripture, that, that pattern, if you will, of look back, Hagar, where have you come from and where are you going? It's a, it's a pattern that after you look back, then you're prepared to look forward. And listen to God's next words in verse 9, and I will make for you, this is right after, tell David, I'm the one that took him from a sheep, or a shepherd, excuse me, to a shepherd boy to a king. He then says, I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And going to verse 12, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, and who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish this kingdom. In order to complete the shift in God's servant David, God basically gives Nathan the vision so he can give it to David. And the vision is the lineage of David, which our faith believes is the lineage that leads to Jesus. Shifts happen, and writing the vision is a key step in orchestrating shifts. And the good news is that the vision God gave to David through Nathan is the very faith we claim, and that is faith in Jesus Christ. And just as God chose to be among the people, so did Jesus. He traveled among the people, feeding the multitudes, making the lame to walk and the blind to see. He stayed among the people and he taught among the people and he ate with the people, the very people that, that the law said he wasn't supposed to eat with or hang with. 
that's who he was with. He cast his own vision in his first recorded message. In Luke 4.18, when he took the text from the Isaiah scroll and said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim the release of captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that vision has not changed. The vision is Jesus and we have the work of Jesus as the body of Christ. We have that work to do. Now that might look different for the church from generation to generation, but I want to propose that that text is central to any church writing a vision. You can make it particular for the community, but Jesus already cast the vision. God, through Jesus Christ, seeks to heal, deliver, and set free God's people. When we, the church, read Jesus' vision, we ought to ask if we ought to bring good news to the poor, where are the poor, Lord? And what is the good news they need today in these times? How can we be that good news? When we read Jesus' vision to proclaim the release to the captives, we ought to ask, where are the captives and how shall we proclaim their release? How do we speak against a $900 million budget line in the state's budget for a new prison when there's a deficit and no money for education. When we look at Jesus' vision and we, and we see recovery of sight to the blind, we should ask, where are the blind among us, Lord? Who can we help recover their sight about the things in this world that count on our ignorance? Lead us, Lord, and first open our eyes so we can help recover the sight of the blind so that your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's a vision for the church. God spoke it to Nathan to tell it to his servant David. And then David, in, in his part of the text in 2 Samuel 19, he says, 719, excuse me, he says, Oh Lord, you have spoken also of your servant's house into the distant future. May this be instruction for the people, oh Lord God. We believe this pointed to Jesus, and Jesus cast the vision and said it was fulfilled in his hearing. And the church, the people, the ministries of the church are the fulfillment of the vision to set the oppressed free. So when you look back over your life this week, that's the assignment. May God reveal to you the places God walked with you and the places God talked with you. The times God fed you and protected you. And, and don't just think of it materially. When did God lift your spirit, lift your countenance? When did God heal your spirit? When did God give you energy to keep on going? When did God open a door? When did God shut a door? When did God bless you and you haven't acknowledged the blessing? When did God instruct you and educate you? Sometimes we can't see it with our naked eye, but as my mentor, Dr. Braxton, says, use your third eye and your third ear. Ask God to reveal it to you and you will sense a shift. Not one that I can cause, not one that anyone else can cause or maybe not even know about explicitly, but you'll fill it down in your soul. And may God place a fire within you to go, to shift, and to do likewise.